uh, at, at one of our last events uh, before COVID. And so, uh, you know, big shoes to fill. Uh, welcome and, and thank you both for joining. Well, I get to interview uh, Elad, so come on. Exactly. I was about to say the same thing about Kevin. So. Exactly. Um, really close to the camera. Am I? Get like, oh. really up there. In there. So. Well, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm getting. I'm excited to be with my friends. Um, okay, so um, let, let's start in the same way uh, as, as the last fireside chat. Uh, uh, Elad, what do you find most impressive or most striking? Uh, about Kevin and, and, and knowing each other uh, for, for, for so long? Sure. Um, so I, I think one of the things that happens in Silicon Valley is that people really move um, in these founder sort of circles and cycles and investor circles and cycles and angel circles and cycles. And they kind of turn over every four or five years. And I feel like we're going through a giant refresh now. And Kevin is one of those very few people who's been incredibly relevant in every cycle for the past, I guess at this point, 20 years. So everything from being a seed investor in PayPal, starting Zoom, funding Pinterest, Airbnb, um, starting Eventbrite, and now he's doing a SPAC. I mean, he's basically been, you know, cresting every single wave, and there's very, very few people who do that. And so I think that's been incredibly impressive. That's, that's a great compliment. What do you think separates the people who, who can do that from ones who sort of flame out or, or, or can't do that? Yeah, I think it's three things, maybe. Number one, um, you know, they tend to um, be both smart and helpful and people go to them for advice and that advice stays relevant because in many cases they're either operating or they're really in the weeds of stuff. And I think that really matters. Um, I think number two is um, they tend to be very driven by learning things and what's the next thing and what's interesting and interestingness. And so because of that, they're constantly like exploring the next frontier. I think Naval is kind of like that too. You know, he got into Bitcoin really early because it seemed really interesting and he's kind of cresting these waves and now there's the rolling funds and, you know, and so I think it's that sort of innate um, curiosity. And then lastly, it tends to be people who are high integrity because, you know, otherwise every cycle your reputation will get destroyed. So you have to actually be, um, you know, an ethical and good person. Yeah, another characteristic of, of the people you, you mentioned is that they take enough bets uh, to, and that some of them can, can really work out. Um, and, and you're not known for the things that don't work out. You're think, known for the things that, that, that do. Um, Ke Kevin, uh, how about you? What do you find sort of most striking or, or unique or, or most impressive about uh, a lot? Well, I, I, the intellectual curiosity side is always front and center for what I see as the best investors out there. And, and that is um, there's a broad range as we've gone through each cycle. There's this kind of cascading number of new areas. And a lot is one of those few people that can cover everything from, you know, the, the biosciences side to, you know, SaaS software to consumer and so on. So he's got a deep intellect and, and, you know, and it covers so many different areas as we've branched out. It's been intimidating to me to see um, how many great markets, intimidating and awe-inspiring, I should say, uh, to see how many great markets have unfolded in so many different areas. And um, Elad's one of those few as an individual that really can comprehend such a broad range of topics and areas. Yeah. So let's um let's get more into into background and then we'll get get a bit technical. Uh, Kevin, why don't you talk about your your latest venture and, and maybe you could sort of detail the journey you you've taken to get there because over the past few years you you've sort of taken a few few you know bets. So you you were a partner at Founders Fund for a bit. You were you were at Eventbrite, of course. You sort of dabbling on on your own stuff a bit. How did you end up here and, and why did you sort of say, hey, this is the opportunity for, for me right now? I think I've always loved being an operator. And so it's everything's kind of circulated around that um, that premise. And the other side is, you know, what, um, just switching to a different context is what Elad said about Naval of being curious and identifying new things. And I think it's our job in the valley and when i mean the valley the wider tech ecosystem around the world if it's seattle or stockholm or wherever now uh and and that is to find new trends and to seize upon them and they don't always play out they don't always work out as as we hope but in those cases they do um that's it's very important to um try to drive those forward and and that's what i would say about the late stage um, kind of project I'm working on, and that's launching a SPAC with my uh, partner, Troy Steckenrider. And, and that very much is something that is not a technological innovation, but it's a financial innovation. 
So we see just as venture capital transformed the landscape uh, in the 70s and 80s and, and then really took off in the 90s or say why Comet or, or what you're doing, Eric, in Village Global has really uh, kind of helped on the form. It really accelerated or catalyzed the formation stage. We see the SPAC as a vehicle to get companies in the public market um, effectively and efficiently uh, today. And that's what we're, you know, I would say the Rebel Alliance is trying to drive with what Reed is doing, what Chamath is doing, what we're trying to do, Mickey uh, at Ribbit, uh, Mark Stott at Dragoneer. So that's, that's um, in short, what I'm up to in addition to finding the time to meet with some really exciting uh, new entrepreneurs starting new ventures. Yeah. Let's let's focus on on SPACs for for a second. Um, is this sort of a temporary uh, innovation? Uh, I mean, you I think you've taken two two companies public, maybe more. Uh, how do you like five years from now? We're having a conversation of what it means to go public and sort of what are the what are the options and how are people thinking about it? How do you think we're having that conversation differently from from today? Well, we we hope and you know we hope it's not um, you know as many have framed in an ICO phenomenon. It could be. Uh, we'll see how it um, plays out, uh, but you know, a, a number of us have taken the risk to to wade into this with the with the belief and conviction that it will be um, another viable vehicle, just like uh, a traditional IPO or a direct listing or otherwise. It's you know, it's choice is great. So for a founder to be able to have the choice between. Uh, a traditional IPO or direct listing or taking a private round, another private round or uh, taking the direction of a SPAC is um, is a great thing. Choice is good. I think people also don't realize that SPACs have actually been around for uh, decades, literally. And the, the key innovation here is really applying them uh, to growth stage technology companies, um, as well as, you know, a lot of the advantages that that provides. So, I, you know, um, I think I think there's all sorts of innovations happening through Kevin and others participating in these things. But these are structures that have existed for a while, and they used to just take out you know slower growth, sleepier companies, and help them get into public markets. So it's 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 actually not a new phenomenon; it's a new application of the phenomena. And so when you ask, is it going to exist in the future? Of course, it's going to exist. The question is, you know, does it exist for these types of technology companies that we're talking about? And, and do you have a take on that? Um, I'm a little bit wait and see. I mean, it, it feels like a really good instrument for certain companies. Yeah. And part of that is a forward guidance that was talked about. Um, part of that is just the speed to be able to actually go public. So I think it has a number of advantages relative to other structures. And then the other structures have relative advantages relative to SPACs, depending on what you're doing and the type of company you have and how you're thinking about it. So um, I, I don't see any a priori reason why it wouldn't keep working. Um, but the flip of it is we're also in a time with very open public markets. And at some point, that window may shut. And one could argue SPACs may become more valuable in that sort of setting um, because you have the capital and means by which to take a company public in a rougher environment. So I, I think it'll be interesting to watch. Uh, what everyone's really wondering a lot is where's your SPAC? I tried to convince him a lot. He, he wrote up a really good post on, on SPAC. So if you haven't read that, um, take a look at that. Uh, but come on, a lot. We're, we're pushing. <laughs> we're, 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 I have SPAC Envy. I was actually going to wear my T-shirt with the SPAC Envy on it. So. <laughs> it's easy to raise the funds. It's the challenge is finding an enduring business. And, you know, as Alad pointed out, um, you know, there's the, the jury is still out. The two, the two biggest challenges I see is one, the kind of over, um, you know, over generous economics of a SPAC. They are what is called the promote. The promote is 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 akin to a carry, except if the investment collapses in half in value, you still get half the value of the promote, which is very high. Um, and so there needs to be some reformation around the economics to put the cost of capital in line with the traditional IPO or direct listing. We're working on that. The second is just reputational. And that takes time. We think it's we think it's a lot like the internet. Uh, the internet was this kind of shady thing that had been around for decades and then commercialized and is now driving the world economy. Or Bitcoin, you know, with its uh, tool of money launderers and um, other unsavory characters, and is now um, mainstreaming as a real store of value. Yeah. And how are you thinking about your approach in terms of of finding the right company, or how do you sort of different? Like, what's different between that and sort of your late stage investing that you've done maybe in an angel capacity? How, how do you how are you approaching it? 
You know, it's very much the same. You're looking for great teams, um, enduring businesses and big markets. And, I, you know, I love finding the very unique company that's maybe not the most obvious that has some type of, I wouldn't call it tarnish, but, but something that is not one of many other companies. Um, and so the hard part is it was very simple, honestly, with, with four of us, um, two full-time and two part-time, we were able to have our org meeting on July 18th. We, um, filed an org meeting is first meeting with, we worked with Goldman Sachs and Goodwin Proctor, our law firms. We first all met, we filed on in the beginning of July and we were trading on August 18th. So 60 days with, you know, effectively two full-time, two part-time people, shout out to Laura DePetra for all her help on the legal side, um, is, is incredible. And that's an innovation. That's an innovation of everything from Zoom uh, to do the roadshow in rapid order to, uh, to DocuSign, to be able to sign hundreds of documents, um, you know, without waiting for a notary or traveling around or so on. So this, this has been part of the phenomenon of, uh, of the SPAC. Um, the hard part, though, is finding the enduring businesses. We're not looking for um, what we would call the miracle cancer drug, um, which you know is a company that goes public with you know no revenues or nor the prospects of revenue, is what um, Mike Moritz famously said in the '90s. And uh, and hopefully, you know, in two or three years, there's a big um, boom. We're trying to find those companies that you know have shown a history of rapid growth, high margin, margin expansion. And, and work with them. And, and that will be the big challenge is, is to find that partner. Yeah. Uh, a, a lot. How, how have you thought about where you sort of uh, you know, specialize or, or fit in within the ecosystem in the sense that you've incubated companies, you've obviously been angel investing a long time, um, I, I, whether it's angel, whether it's focusing on starting a fund or teaming up, how have you sort of thought about the intersection where you want to spend your time and, and make your biggest impact? Uh, it's a good question. Honestly, it hasn't been that calculating. Um, so, you know, I started off, um, you know, as a founder, and then I was helping other founders who were sort of part of my peer group. Some of them just started pulling me in to invest in their companies as I was helping them with introductions or first hires or whatever it was. And then as companies started to get later stage, I started pulling together SPVs or other vehicles to invest in them, um, simply because, you know, I, I knew the companies really well and thought they were really strong, so I wanted to keep helping and participating and all the rest of it. Uh, and then on the sort of starting or incubation or help, helping things get going side, um, you know, I just really enjoy like uh, working on products or building things or helping pull together initial teams. And so I, I just honestly just been following what I enjoy versus, you know, some calculated master plan. And then I feel like I should get one in place. So <laughs> all about my deficiencies today. It's like no SPAC, no master plan. <laughs> you know, I'm, uh, I'm starting to worry. Totally. Um, the, uh, we, yeah, your master plan is not having a master plan. It, it, it's, uh, the, you know, the, the authentically authentic, um, uh, Lod, talk about how you recommend people to find their own angel style. That's sort of, uh, advice you, you give and, and you've, you know, implemented yourself. How, how do you think about that? Yeah, it's a good question. I think ultimately there are, um, three or four components to a person's style. I think the first one is what do you actually invest in? So are you only doing an early stage? Do you do late stage? Um, what sector do you invest in? Do you mess in everything? Do you cut out certain things? Like I don't do anything in healthcare, ed educational, uh, ed tech related stuff, for example, anymore. Um, you know, how do you weigh team versus market and how many do you do, do you do per year? So the first question is like, what do you invest in? Second question is how are you actually gonna help people? Um, are you really good at sales and go to market? Can you help with general company building? You know, I used to uh, literally go and meet the heads of M&A of all the major companies so that if a company ever was trying to sell, um, I could introduce them for an exit, right? Um, so what do you actually do that's valuable or differentiated or useful? Um, third is probably how do you get your investments? Um, is it through referrals? Is it because you just came out of a core network like a Stripe? Um, is it because you write a lot of content and you, you get inbound? And then lastly, it's almost like what are you known for? It's, you know, what, what do you, how do you market yourself? Um, what do, when founders talk what, and a topic comes up, what is that topic that, that people say, hey, you should really talk to, um, you know, Kevin or Eric or, you know, um, read for. And so I, I, I must read as like the, those four components of what do you invest in? How do you help? What is your mechanism for getting investments? And what are you known for? And I think those things all evolve over time. But I actually think being thoughtful about that can make a really big difference. 
Um, and that's where maybe it's worth being methodical and thinking through, you know, what's important. Yeah. Kevin, how about you? You've been angel investing for a long time. I think you started out with Keith Ravoy and I think Jolly from, from, from YouTube. How have you sort of refined your, your angel investing practice over the years and, and what advice do you have? Well, I invest much more independently these days um, versus when investing with Javin and Keith. I really liked the give and take of having, uh, th you know, three different voices or I got to listen to two different voices. And I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. Everyone has a different style. I've, um, you know, I mostly learn by, you know, getting to be around Keith and seeing him or Javid and his deep technical insights. Uh, so, so it's really the... In, in now I do spend a lot of time in addition with, you know, we, we won't call him the old guard because, you know, as you said, I, you know, my walker is also just right around the corner. Um, but spending a lot of time with a new breed of investors that give new insights. So it's, it's really, um, it's, it's, it's like an open source software project, which I apply that, you know, to a lot of different things that you can see how others work and intake and borrow that. So I would say, you know, there's always the kind of core principles of great teams, big markets and competitive advantages. But inside of that, there's always a, a kind of cycling of of new ways to look at businesses or new. Um, y yeah, new new styles. And there are a lot of different styles. I think that every, you know, for example, venture funds each have their own personality. Uh, so if you take, say, a Greylock or Sequoia, which tends to be more hands-on, helps with recruiting, um, you know, versus say a founders fund, which is fiercely independent, um, always, you, you know, let the founder be more focused on finding the great investment and letting that founder run with it. Um, you know, those are two very independent styles and there's no right or wrong way. They both produce massive, uh, they both help facilitate massive um, hits. So I've tried not to, be to, um, I've tried to learn and adapt over time and, and change the times, which um, is probably, you know, maybe it's arguably to my detriment because you, um, because I've tried different styles and, uh, but it's, it's been something that, that I've enjoyed and, and um, love seeing each new cycle. Yeah. Let's talk about the business of venture capital for, for, for a couple few minutes. If we're having this conversation 10 years from now in, uh, in 2030, you're definitively the, both of you, the old guard. Uh, and we're talking about the state of venture. Uh, how, how is that world different for, from this world? Is, is it mostly the same? And I think some people might argue that 2010, 2020 might, might be mostly the same and that the, the, the same firms are still great in the same way that the same universities more or less are, are, are still great. There's not that much disruption or, and is it still the same way of doing the business or is there something fundamentally disruptive or fundamentally different, whether it's new models or you know, people are experimenting with data in different ways What's your sort of take on, on, on the future of venture uh, 10 years out? Uh, a, a lot. How about you? I think things have changed pretty radically, actually, over the last 10 years. Um, well, you would know better than me. So say, say more. And so I, th I think there's um, three or four big innovations that have happened. And I actually think we're seeing a new wave right now, actually. Um, the first big wave, or uh, one of the big waves, was just YC and the emergence of an accelerator is something that was actually important. Um, and I think before, a lot of people thought, oh, maybe there's selection bias and the bad companies to go, go to YC or other things like that. Like, I never believed that personally, but that was sort of the early scuttlebutt. Um, second, I think we saw a really big shift in terms of how people thought about secondaries and later stage funds through DST and sort of the move they made with Facebook. And that was a very radical move at the time, you know, do a giant investment and take a board seat, buy secondary, blend it, et cetera. Um, and then the third big innovation, which I think is now playing out in rolling funds, was really the emergence of um, angel lists and the, the thinking of sort of distributed angels finding the best investments across a portfolio of people. Um, and it was sort of the early look into like a distributed venture model. And I think that's now sort of perpetuating through some of the interesting things you folks are doing and um, angel lists is doing and others are doing. So I actually think there's a lot of innovation in the last 10 years. I think every, um, you know, four to five years, a new um, major branded venture firm emerges and one dies or almost dies. And so for example, Founders Fund has actually emerged over the last decade. Andreessen has really just emerged over the last decade. I think they're 10 years old now, effectively. So um, I do think you see these turnovers in firms. I think the most interesting thing that's happening right now in venture is the um, emergence of um, a, an entirely new network, which is way more solo capitalist driven than before. And if you go back to the 60s and 70s, Arthur Rock, who funded Intel and Apple, even though he started Davis and Rock, was effectively a solo capitalist, right? I mean, it started um, 40, 50 years ago. Um, 
And there's always been practitioners of it, and then Naval and Michael Deering and McMaples and others sort of um, rose in the mid-2000s. Um, but I think fundamentally, uh, there is a really big shift in terms of relevance. And if you look at who's showing up on, uh, in terms of investing in the best companies, um, it's a lot more people like that. And I think the shift that's happening isn't just generational, but it's also stylistic in terms of not really going for as much percent ownership. So that's like the notion in Rome rounds where they sold 5% of the company instead of doing a, a major venture round where they sell 20% of the company or whatever it is. Um, I think that's one big shift. And, you know, those books are moving more aggressively into A's and B's and C's in ways that didn't exist in the prior generation of, of the solo folks. Um, rolling funds, you know, we maybe can talk about later, but uh, I do think 10 years from now, we'll see a handful of firms that are still the same brands that have survived, but they're going to be full stack like they are today. You know, Sequoia used to be a single fund. Now it's $8 billion in capital every cycle. Um, and then we'll see niche differentiation, right? Uh, or I should say specialization. It's things like Ribbit in terms of verticals or it's things like early stage funds and the like, and everybody in between, I think, will get squeezed out. Um, so I do think there's, there's lots of really interesting dynamics that will play out over 10 years. Yeah. Kevin, do you have a hot take? And if, after, we'll go to Julia. Oh, that's, that, yeah, that's hard to, um, I, I mean, that's the sweeping view of Silicon Valley in just uh, maybe three minutes. That's incredible. Uh, maybe to take it the other direction would be that it's, like, I, I hope I fall in the, in, you know, the two attributes of intellectual curiosity and hard work. Um, and so those investors that always can really focus there are going to find success through any era. And then there's second, you know, there's an investor that's very good at sales. I'm lousy at sales, so I have to work extra hard. Uh, but if, if one is very good at wooing uh, founders, you know, that's that's uh, in, in closing them. You know that that's certainly a, a way in. I think there's one could argue asymmetrical data as a third category. I, I just haven't seen many firms really distinguish um, themselves with you know some special sauce of finding companies uh, before others. It's usually just hustle um, the bottom line. But I think we'll always be in the case of just trying to find those extraordinary people um, that are emerging out of left field that you wouldn't imagine that are that you know are doing something completely different that get recognized first will always be the formula for success totally let's uh, let's go let's go to julia hey a lot kevin thanks for uh being here um you obviously have both been investors for a long time and have seen technology changes um and just circumstances changing curious how do each of you develop your points of view on what the future will look like and where the opportunities for investment are Maybe I can take that uh, first. Thanks, uh, Julia. I usually when I try to predict the future, I'm wrong, and so I look for breadcrumbs of of interesting kind of new phenomenon. But it's really the people behind it. When I've tried to predict the future, it's usually I'll I'll find a company that sounds like it's my perception of the future, invest in it, and it's usually out of something of a sci-fi movie that some Hollywood director has done. And you're either wrong in timing or just wrong in the, getting the right team. So I'm, um, I've been much more successful when I'm team focused um, and I'm probably not the best to prognosticate, you know, what will happen. I could talk about, you know, well, computer vision is really interesting because there's a lot of investment that's been done in autonomous cars, but maybe autonomous cars won't happen as soon as we think. And so that computer vision space will spill out into other verticals and, I know a lot's invested in some of these other verticals, and, and I have a few, but I, um, you know, I, I can be less out, like as a solo, I guess I'm a solo practitioner, as an individual, it's, it's really the people that come to me, and I can't go out and see that full landscape. So even more so, I need to just really focus on great founders. Yeah, cool. yeah I, I think there's um, an evolution of um, spotting trends over your career. And I feel like early on, if you're in the right entrepreneurial pocket, like, you know, Julia, you came out of Open Door and there's all these people doing super interesting things about Open Door, or ex Open Door people doing super interesting things. Um, and I feel like there's a handful of core networks where a lot of the innovation is happening. And sometimes it's because they came across really interesting things while they were working on their own company or infrastructure that they're not spinning out. And so I feel like early in many people's investing career, they're coming out of a core network. And that network is doing incredible things and you're just effectively investing behind your friends doing interesting things in interesting markets. We have great intuition to just operate it in the middle of the thing and you know everything about it. And then I think as you get later 
uh, away from that operating experience, the way that you think about the future really shifts. And uh, to Kevin's point, sometimes there are these little breadcrumbs where there are these people who are all digging around in an interesting area. Um, you know, if there was a thousand engineers doing interesting things in crypto a few years ago, probably crypto was interesting. You know, it's sort of like, where are the, the people on the fringe investing their time? And fringe is meant in a good way, obviously. Um, so I think that's really important to watch. And then sometimes there are macro trends, and sometimes people miss all those, like, the early clean tech wave in the 2000s was a BC invented thing that just was a disaster. Um, uh, but, um, you know, sometimes you can kind of say, well, you know what, there's this big shift in machine learning and, you know, every phone shifts leads to a shift in the underlying semiconductor technologies, you know, NVIDIA for GPUs, Broadcom for networking equipment, Intel for the microcomputer. So probably there's going to be something similar for machine learning and therefore, you know, can I look at those companies and, and you know, get involved with the very best ones for inference training, for example. So I, I think I think it's a mix. Um, I think the, the thousands of great entrepreneurs will come up with better ideas than any investor, but the flip of it is, um, I think early on you may be in that pocket of a thousand people really deeply, and then later on you're going to have to figure out how to find it. Cool. Thanks for sharing. Thanks so much. Just one other additional point just on that is that I think it's really interesting what in into hang on those words of what Elad has said about these different networks of companies like Stripe, you had John and Patrick building an extraordinary company, but around extraordinary people. And I wonder if it's less their insights and more about being able to attract the best and brightest, put them all together, have them learn from each other, and then have them go off um, on their own. And so you see those types of, it's, it's more driven by, you know, their performance and intellect versus keen insights on the future. Um, and, you know, as you said, that's the same, whether it's Eric and the team at Open Door or any of the other networks. Yeah. So we're, we're one minute over time. So this will be our last question. Um, uh, and I'll, uh, I'll let Alice ask in a second. Uh, a lot. I, I want you to talk about your, your COVID investment thesis or, or, or where you're excited right now. And then Alice, why don't you ask your question and a lot you can answer, you know, both at the same time. I was wondering, uh, so I'm sorry, so Alice should ask the question first? Or? Yeah, Alice, please ask. First, I just want to say thanks for um, highlighting Arthur Rock and like previous solo capitalists in history, because as a solo GP of a new fund, I didn't know about those. And it's quite like heartening to hear about it and cool to go research it, I guess. Um, my question is really around macro, and it's not really fair to put anyone on the spot and say, what do you think about macro 12 months from now? But I read your blog post in May about, you know, the or about the, the markets and it seems like they're still, you know, pretty decoupled. And so I'd love to hear your thoughts on kind of what this what the ecosystem might look like twelve months from now and managing capital and things like that. Yeah, so um I completely mispredicted this year from a macro perspective. Um I thought it was gonna be a complete disaster scenario. And I think what happened is half the economy is in a disaster and the other half is in good times. And um, if you look at public markets, for example, the S&P, um, most of the sort of traditional uh, retail, offline stocks, et cetera, have actually seen a, a, a pretty big decrease um, from beginning of the year. And it's really the tech stocks, and in particular, uh, FANG plus a few SaaS companies that have actually floated the whole thing because they've grown so much in terms of market cap. And they're really dominating the market cap of the overall exchanges. And so I, I think we're in a really interesting split economy right now. Obviously. Um, uh, BPP also helped in terms of floating people for uh, longer. And the real question is, do we have more stimulus packages and what do those look like? And part of that's probably going to be dependent on the election. Um, and so, you know, I, I found it extremely hard to predict. I think the last few months have been really interesting in that, um, you know, March, the entire venture community froze and nothing was happening. April was a bunch of preemptive and inside rounds or maybe April, May, where people um, were investing in their very best portfolio companies. Uh, June, July, things started to loosen and people started investing in other things. And then like August, September is just, you know, good times are rolling. <laughs> and so um, I, I don't know how this ends. I, I thought uh, the end of this year was going to be much worse. And I thought there'd be a couple months of optimism, which I thought would be the summer. And obviously we did have a very optimistic summer. But m my thinking at the time, which again is, is now maybe going to be wrong in the short run, um, was that we'd see a second wave of COVID now in the fall. And we haven't seen a second wave yet in the US. What we saw was regional waves, right? We had the Northeast and then we had the South and um, parts of California now is going actually up into the Midwest. Um, but every country is, you know, or many countries in Europe, for example, are now seeing bigger waves than they saw before, right? France, Spain, et cetera. And that's all predictable. If you look at every 
prior respiratory virus in history. This is what happens with respiratory viruses. Uh, so, it, you know, in March, I think I wrote a blog post saying we'd be second waves. Um, so I, I just think like we're going to see a second wave of COVID. Vaccines are going to take longer than people think. And then I have no idea how the economy is going to react to that. Awesome. That's a, it's a great place to wrap. Uh, thank you, Alice and Julia, for the questions. Thank you a lot, and Kevin, for, for joining us and, and sharing your, your wisdom with us. And uh, thanks to Reed and Shamath for, for coming earlier. And thanks to everybody uh, uh, for, for, for joining this uh, Angel Island event. I hope you met some great people. I hope you follow up. We can help, uh, we can help facilitate that. And, and more broadly, thank you for, for being part of the village. So that, that's it on, on, behalf of, uh, on behalf of all of us.